So let me start. Okay. Let me start with a brief intro. Uh, hello all, welcome to the webinar series of the National Observatory of Athens project Pangea for Calval. Um, the project aims to enhance the scientific activities around the new climate observatory of NOAA, the Panhellenic Geophysical Observatory of Adikithira, or Pangea, with new knowledge, research, and tools to create a center of for satellite calibration and validation in the Mediterranean region. This is the first webinar series of the webinar, webinar of the webinar series we have planned within the framework of the project. Sorry, because some people are still, yeah, they are still joining, yes. And uh, we are very happy that we start with the interesting work of Dr. Claire Ryder on the radiative effects of water vapor and dust in the Sahara air layer. Dr. Claire Ryder is an associate professor in the University of Reading. Her research explores the role of mineral dust and aerosols in the climate system. Often... Sorry, <laughs> someone uh, has uh, some music interest now. Uh, yeah, uh, her research explores the role of mineral dust and aerosols in the climate system, often with a focus on the size of dust particles and radiative properties using in situ observations such as aircraft measurements, as well as satellite retrievers and modeling approaches. Uh, sorry, if you can uh, turn off your, um, your uh, microphone so there is no noise in the background, that will be good. Okay, sorry, it was accident, sorry. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so her work also includes research of biomass burning aerosol from fires and other types of aerosols and their impacts, including the impacts of dust on solar energy generation. In this webinar, Claire will present her interesting work on the effects of water vapor presence in the radiative effect of dust at Eastern Atlantic. As a brief intro, dust is transported from Sahara Desert to the Atlantic Ocean within a well-mixed elevated layer known as the Saharan air layer or SAL. SAL was generally considered to be drier than the surrounding Breathe. tropical atmosphere. Breath. But new research has shown that the drier part is the lower SAL, whereas the upper part of the SAL presents enhanced moisture. Claire will present the effect of this enhanced moisture in the radiative effect of dust, along with other possible implications. So we hope you enjoy this webinar. Um, Joanna will send in the chat a link um, to submit your questions and we will have a, approximately 10 minutes Q&A session at the end uh, of um, Claire's presentation. So with no further, further ado, Claire, please start your presentation. Well, thank you, uh, Joanna, for the introduction, um, and uh, thank you for inviting me today to talk to you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to come and talk about dust, as always, and uh, nice to see you all again. Um, so I'm going to, as Joanna said, talk about um, enhanced, dust, uh, enhanced water vapour in the upper sal and how this is associated with dustiness and also the radiative effects of this. Um, so this work draws a lot on aircraft observations and the uh, project planning and the flight planning by the AirD and ICD teams and FAM. So I'd like to extend my thanks to them as well before I start. Okay, um, and the background picture here, I should add, is a picture from the campaign I'm going to talk about. So you can see um, the aircraft wing and some um, instrument cloud probes and aerosol probes hanging down here, and then a dusty and cloudy Saharan air layer beneath the plane. Okay, so um, starting at the beginning, what is the SAL? So it's the Saharan air layer. Um, the concept of the SAL has been around for quite a while by some um, classic papers, um, particularly um, some older ones by Prospero and Carlson, but also with um, illustrated by this nice um, schematic from Carrie Ampudi paper. Um, so over the Sahara Desert, we have intense solar heating and we also have dust emissions. Um, here we have a cross section as well showing a similar concept. Um, the dust and the dry hot air has been conceptualized to be mixed up to higher altitudes, um, typically five to six kilometers. And then the prevailing um, easterly winds then transport this dusty dry air layer out 
westwards across the Atlantic. Um, and as this um, elevated layer moves westwards, it descends. Um, on the eastern side in particular, it has a marine boundary layer beneath it. Um, and you can see it also interacts with African easterly waves and the prevailing meteorology, which um, mean that it's not just a, a direct um, straight plume, but it tends to have these wiggles. Um, so the concept of the Saharan air layer has been around for a while, and generally it's um, talked about as being a very dry layer, not always dusty, but frequently dusty, but always dry. Um, down here on the left, we've got um, a later paper by Carson from 2016, which shows some quite nice concepts of how over the, the source region of the desert, we tend to have these well mixed profiles of potential temperature and moisture, um, and then an inversion at their top. As this layer then moves to the west, um, we see the marine boundary layer um, undercutting this elevated mix layer, and then this mix layer then becomes detached from the surface. Um, and we call it an elevated layer, and that can change its characteristics as it moves on and is transported. Um, so we all know this quite well. Um, however, um, during our flights over the Atlantic um, during 2015, as part of the ISD campaign, we frequently would kind of um, fly horizontally and then penetrate a dust layer. And we noticed that quite often the water vapor content would kind of jump up as we got into these um, dusty layers. Um, and this occurred to me as something slightly strange, counter to what you might expect, um, because we expect the dust layers to be dry. And this led to this work developing, which I'm going to talk about today, uh, which has eventually resulted in this paper, which you can see here. So um, I'm going to be showing data from the Air D field campaign. Um, this took place in August 2015. It was a subsection of the ICE D, ICE and Dust um, field campaign. Um, we're based in Praia on the Cape Verde Islands, just here. And here you can see um, in colours um, the profiles that we performed during the field campaign. So going from up above the dust layer, so five or six kilometres and down as close as we can get to the surface, which is typically around 50 metres above the surface. Um, and you can see by the colour coding that we sampled a range of different aerosolopsical depths. Um, the dominant aerosol was dust. Um, and we also went as far north as the Canary Islands on one flight. Um, I've just listed um, some other publications here which um, present results from this field campaign, which might be of interest, um, spanning um, an overall campaign summary and some unusual results um, by Franco Marenko, um, through to composition, optical properties, comparisons with models, and ice nucleating particles. I won't go into the details of any of those today. Um, but they're, they're well worth looking at. So I'm not going to talk in detail about the um, dust measurements um, from this campaign, but the work I'm presenting does use them. So I'll, I'll just briefly summarise them here. So we had many in situ observations during this field campaign. Um, we measured size distributions, optical properties, um, meteorological properties and much more. So you can see, um, for example, some of the cloud and aerosol probes here hanging down beneath the wing, some of our inlets here, um, which we just sort of derive the composition from on filter samples. And also in the background there, you can see some um, radiometers on the aircraft. Um, but the take home messages are that we measured fairly coarse particles. You can see the mean size distribution here in black with a, a modal value peaking at about five to eight microns. Um, so Air D is the black one, um, Fennec field campaigns over the desert are shown in orange. Our mean single scattering albedo in the visible was 0.95. Um, we measured the composition, which was dominated by silicates and quartz um, for sizes larger than 0.5 microns, so dust. Um, we did find that the particles smaller than about 0.5 microns were um, non-dust mostly, um, dominated by sulfates and salts. Um, the particles were non-spherical um, with a range of aspect ratios, and the larger particles had slightly more uh, non-spherical uh, characteristics than the smaller end of the dust um, size range. Um, and all this is um, summarised in my paper from 2018, if you want to look at more detail. Um, and here's a table of the, the mean properties from, from this field campaign. Um, so moving on. Thinking about what we saw in terms of the moisture structure um, from this field campaign, 
um, what I've got here is I have separated all the profiles which we did um, as shown in the map on the previous slide into um, a range of AODs. So starting from low AODs on the left hand side, um, and you can see the AOD category on the top of the figures, so less than 0 0.3, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6, 0 0.6 to 1 and greater than 1 um, on the right hand side in red. And on the top line, we have the extinction profiles um, measured in situ on the aircraft. So you can see um, when we didn't have much dust, obviously the extinction is fairly low. We've got some slightly transient layers of dust, even though the AOD is quite low. And as you would expect, as the AOD increases, we see more and more dust um, <laughs> developing into this uh, well-defined Saharan air layer, peaking at about um, seven to 800 hectopascals or about three kilometers, as we would expect. Um, if we then look, let's go down and look at the temperature profile. So here I'm showing potential temperature. Um, so as we go from less dusty to more dusty conditions, we can see that we start with this gradually um, increasing with height potential temperature structure over here. And as we go through towards the dusty cases, um, we see this warming in the dust layers, which is what we'd expect based on the um, Saharan air layer conceptualization uh, model. Um, and then in between, we got we get kind of uh, halfway house situations. The uh, black line in these figures is the tropical standard profile. So this is a profile um, frequently used in modeling or rate of transfer, which is actually constructed from, from many thousands of profiles in different parts of the tropics. Um, so then if we look at water vapor, um, this is the mixing ratio in grams per kilogram of water vapor. Um, if we start with low AOD cases, um, we can see it's moisture close to the surface and it that drops off with height, as you might expect. Um, it's similar to the tropical standard, although even in our least dusty case, we see significantly more moisture in our flight measurements than we do compared to the tropical standard. Um, and this will become important later. Then as we go towards more and more dusty cases, I go to the far case now, um, if we look at first at the lower cell, we see that the dusty cases where we have a strong Saharan air layer are much drier um, than our tropical standard. However, if we go towards the upper cell, because this um, profile is well mixed and therefore kind of straightish, um, we now have increased water vapor at these upper cell altitudes. And in fact, all the way up through to where the aircraft measurements um, finish, we have enhanced water vapor um, compared to the tropical standard. I should add, um, it's important not just to compare it to the tropical standard because we see that the even the non-dusty case already has more water vapor than the tropical standard. So in subsequent slides, I'll compare these two against each other. Okay, so what, what we see now is smooth profiles as a function of different AOD categories. So our uh, red is the dustiest. Um, this is the water vapor profile here, um, going through to blue, the least dusty. Um, this figure here shows the anomaly of each category relative to our blue line, so the low AOD cases. So what can we see? We can see that in the, the lower cell, um, we have quite a lot of drying uh, when we have a dusty cell present, which is what the conventional model um, tells us to expect. However, if we look at higher altitudes, um, we can now see that particularly as we get to larger AOD or dust optical depths, we have enhanced moisture at higher altitudes from about 750-ish hectopascals all the way to the top of the cell. Um, just for a point of reference, you can see the extinction profiles here for each category. So as we uh, go towards higher AODs, we see the, the dust structure developing. Similarly, down at the bottom, we have the temperature, potential temperature profiles. Um, so you can see as we go from the blue, it's kind of fairly gradually changing. Whereas as we go to higher um, AODs or more dusty cases, um, we get this warm um, kind of slot developing. And then again, if we look at the potential temperature anomalies, you can see how um, warm and dry the lower cell is when it's dusty. Um, 
And interestingly, at higher altitudes towards the very top of the cell, in our dustiest cases, we have this cool anomaly, um, which um, is worth noting, and I'll come back to that later. Okay, so what have I done? I wanted to look at these water vapour profiles along with the dust and say, okay, does the change in water vapour profile that we see when we have the dusty cases, particularly this enhancement in water vapour at higher altitudes, how does that affect the radiative balance and the heating rates um, in the long wave and the short wave? Um, and how big is that compared to the radiative effect the dust alone is exerting? So in this paper, I set up a series of experiments um, using a radiative transfer model. And we have these 22 profiles. So for each profile individually, I've run a series of experiments. Um, so to start off with, I have control. Um, for the temperature profile, which is important for the long wave simulations, um, we use the aircraft observations from the specific profile, and we do this for all cases, in fact. Um, the control doesn't include any dust in terms of the radiation. And then for the water vapour profile, this is the tricky bit. Whereas with dust, you can just turn it off in the radiation scheme. For the water vapour profile, it's not physically meaningful to remove all water vapour from the atmosphere because it always exists in varying quantities. Um, so what we do is for the control case, we simply take this blue line of water vapour profile. So this is our water vapour profile for when we have low AODs, and I call that the background profile of water vapour. Then for the dust case, I do exactly the same thing, but um, dust is included as measured by aircraft observations. Then we have a water vapour only case, um, which again has no dust. Um, but instead of now using this blue line um, for the water vapour profile, the individual profile for that specific flight or profile is used. So that might be one of the red ones or the orange or the green, depending on the case. Um, and then finally, we have a dust and water vapour combined, which is basically the combination of the dust only and the water vapour only um, all combined together. So this then allows us to compare each of these three lower lines experiments to our control to look at the effect only of the dust or only of the water vapour or of everything combined together. Um, this is the equation I use to define the DRE or the direct radiative effect. Um, it's the net radiation um, for the experiment of choice compared to the control. So for example, dust compared to the control. Um, net is defined as down minus upwards irradiance. Um, spectrum refers to the long wave or short wave or total, which is the sum of the two. Um, the level, the LEV, refers to either the top of atmosphere or surface. Um, and the experiment is the experiment. The data are instantaneous values which are diurnally average. Um, and the convention is that positive values at the top of the atmosphere indicates a warming of the Earth atmosphere system. And then finally, the second equation um, gives the atmospheric heating, or which is sometimes called the radiative convergence. So if we have positive values, the atmosphere is being warmed. Um, so a bit about what I'm doing with the radiative transfer model. I'm using the Socrates model um, from the Edwards and Slingo 1996 paper. It computes short wave and long wave fluxes. It uses a two stream model um, covering these spectral ranges for the two um, spectra. Um, it does include long wave scattering, which is um, frequently overlooked. So particularly for the long wave um, interacting with the dust, it does include long wave scattering, which can make a difference. Um, we input the various dust and temperature and water vapor profiles. Um, and then finally, we calculate the optical properties of the dust um, using the campaign mean properties um, from my 2018 paper. Um, because we're looking at this large spectral region, we need refractive index data to cover that spectrum. Um, so what I've chosen to use is spectrally available data from Colaco et al. 2014 for the shortwave and Volts 
73 for the long wave, which you can see in these figures here. Um, I'm aware that there is much more up to date and um, observationally based information available, particularly from Claudia Di Biagio 2017 and also in the visible for 2019. Um, however, the spectral availability of that data doesn't quite span the range which I need. So um, we didn't use this data in this study. Um, the values I chose were roughly values that sit in the middle of the, the range of some of these values taken from the literature. Um, so then I use a me scattering code to generate the optical properties. This does give a relatively low single scattering albedo of 0.86 in the visible range. And there's two reasons for this. Um, partly is that the Calaco refractive index at 550 nanometers is, is a little bit higher than we find in our observations. Um, and also because of the fact that our visible band covers these wavelengths, so it covers some of the wavelengths where um, refractive index is increasing towards the UV. Um, but we did include some sensitivity tests to vary these optical properties. Okay. So some of the results now. Um, before I go on to the relative transfer um, results, um, I looked at whether there was a relationship between the aerosol optical depth and the precipitable water vapour in the column. So that's what's shown here. Um, the precipitable water vapour, if you haven't come across it, is basically a column integrated amount of water vapour. So you can see the total um, in black here. Um, there's a slight decrease in PWV as AOD increases, but um, it's not significant. Um, if we break the precipitable water vapour up into that from the lower and the upper cell, um, so my lower and upper cell here are defined by these dashed lines you can see in the figure here with these um, range of pressures. Um, we can see that in the lower cell, in the red, as we get more dusty, our water vapour decreases. And in the upper cell, um, as we get more dusty, our water vapour increases. Um, and you can see the numbers here for the rate of um, water vapour increase per unit AOD, and these are statistically significant. Um, so as I mentioned before, previously relative effects of the dry cell have been evaluated, um, but particularly here I wanted to focus on the um, how the structure of the water vapour vertically affects the heating or cooling in the cell, and including the moist upper cell. So this is now the results from the radiative transfer modelling experiments. Um, so what I'm showing here is the shortwave direct radiative effect at the moment. So in these figures, we've got AOD increasing towards the right. Each of these data points comes from one of those 22 profiles that the aircraft made. Um, and then we have the DRE at the top of the atmosphere, in the surface, and through the atmosphere. Um, and we also have it separated. So the orange points, actually, which you can't really see very clearly in this figure, are dust only. Blue are water vapour only, and green are the combination of dust and water vapour. So we can see that generally in the short wave, the water vapour DRE is a pretty small. Um, so that dust then becomes the main driver of the DRE in the short wave, which we would expect. So we see a negative. Um, DRE from dust at the top of the atmosphere um, becomes stronger as we see more and more dust, which makes sense. Um, it's also negative at the surface because the dust prevents shortwave radiation reaching down towards the surface. Um, and therefore it causes a heating in the atmosphere, which strengthens as we get more dust. So these are results are basically as we would expect. So now let's look at the long wave, and this is where we expect water to vapour to have more of a role, so it gets a bit more interesting. Let's start at the top of the atmosphere. So um, all these plots are for the long wave now, but we're saying we've got TOA, surface and atmosphere. Let's start with the TOA. Um, for dust, so the orange point, our TOA effect is now positive, which increases with increase in dust. This is what we would expect. Um, the water vapour effect is mostly positive, but a bit variable. It does increase slightly with AOD, um, which is consistent with increasing water vapour. Um, therefore, when we add these two effects together, 
we get the green results, uh, water vapour and dust, um, such that the long wave top of atmosphere radiative effect of both is larger than we would get from dust on its own. Um, and it's larger by about 19% um, when AOD is greater than 0.6. So it's fairly significant. Now let's look at other layers of the atmosphere. So the dust at the surface, it causes a warming. So that's shown by these orange points here. And in the atmosphere, dust causes a slight cooling. This is what we'd expect. For the water vapour, um, we see that the blue points are the opposite sign to dust, both at the surface and in the atmosphere. Um, so this is consistent with reduced water vapour. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about this in a minute because it gets a little bit complicated. Um, overall, the water vapour inclusion reduces the long wave surface DRE by 49% here. So we're going from orange to the green by including water vapour. Um, and in the atmosphere, we see that including water vapour actually flips the sign of the long wave effect in the atmosphere. So dust only causes the cooling of the atmosphere because the water vapour or the dryness of the atmosphere in the lower cell causes a heating. If we include that structure, it changes our radiative effect from negative to positive. But th these are fairly small values, um, for example, compared to our short wave. Okay, so if we now look at the total direct radiative effect, so short wave plus long wave. Um, yeah, okay. um, our top of atmosphere dust direct radiative effect that's shown in the orange is negative. So overall, dust is cooling the Earth atmosphere system. And this is dominated by the short wave effect um, in these calculations. Um, the effect from the water vapor is positive and that's driven by the long wave effect. And therefore, um, overall, um, the inclusion of the water vapour shifts the dust effect from being quite negative to not quite so negative, a change of 17%. Um, at the surface, our effect of water vapour is quite small. And then in the atmosphere, um, dust is the main driver, which is driven by shortwave heating. Um, and here, the inclusion of the water vapour increases the atmospheric heating um, by 17%, and that's driven by the long wave contribution of the water vapour. I add that it's a slightly complicated interaction between the moistening of the upper cell and the drying of the lower cell. Um, so the next few slides are what I've done to try and separate the two and disentangle how those two effects interact. So what I'm showing here now is how the lower cell affects the radiative effect. Um, so you, we've got radiative effects up here now, so particularly focus on the surface and the atmosphere. But instead of showing AOD now, I'm showing the precipitable water vapour for the lower cell. So over here, we've got drier conditions, and over here, we've got moister conditions. So if we focus on the atmosphere to start with, if we have a drier lower cell, what we see is we get less atmospheric cooling or equivalently more heating. These blue points are positive. Um, and this is because the um, drier portions um, cause more heating. I get myself confused. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, we also see in these drier regions more surface cooling because the drier um, atmosphere with less water vapour emits less long wave radiation back downwards towards the surface. Um, so we see less heating or, or more cooling at the surface. And it, it turns out that um, these effects of the lower cell explain the change in sign for the long wave radiative effect of our dust and water vapour together. Um, for the atmosphere and also for the surface. However, they don't expect explain any changes and we see no trends at all at the top of atmosphere. 
So let's move on next to the upper cell. So again, I'm showing the radiative effects here, um, but now for the amount of water vapour in the upper cell. And as um, the upper cell is going from lower moisture to higher moisture, this is consistent with going from less dusty to dustier in the observations. So firstly, we don't see any relationship between the upper cell moisture at the surface radiative effect in the long wave or the atmosphere. We do see a relationship for the top of atmosphere, however. Um, what we see is when the upper cell is moister, we get a more positive um, top of atmosphere direct radiative effect from the, the blue from the water vapour points. Um, mm -hmm. And this is because we get reduced outgoing long wave radiation from that in increased moisture up there. We see from the orange points that we get um, the same effect from the dust. <laughs> Um, so the dust and the water vapour act in the same direct in the same direction in this region, and therefore our green points um, are much larger in terms of our DRE. And this then explains why we get an amplified long wave TOA direct radiative effect from water vapour and dust when the two are combined. Okay. So lastly, looking at heating rates. Because um, this potentially affects what our dust particles are doing in that dust layer. Um, so what we've got here are heating rates as a function of pressure in the short wave, in the long wave and in the total. And then for each experiment, so the control, dust only, water vapour only, and then the two together. <coughs> so if we start by looking at dust, um, so the, I should say from here downwards, these are the changes relative to the control. Excuse me. Um, so we see that dust causes a short wave heating, a long wave cooling, and then overall a total heating. For water vapour, um, we don't see much in the short wave, but we do see this slight heating at the top of the cell. Um, in the long wave, generally, um, we see this um, lower cell heating from our, our dry layer at the bottom of the cell. And then we also see this at the very top of the cell, um, this upper cell cooling. Then if we now compare the total effect of the dust to the total effect of dust and water vapour, this tells us about the impact of including water vapour on top of just the dust. Um, so what we see is we see additional cooling at high altitudes as a result of the water vapour inclusion. We see additional um, increased heating throughout most of the cell. Um, we do see that the radiative effects um, from the lower cell dryness are felt more broadly throughout the cell than specifically just where that dry portion happens. Uh, and I think that's a result of the density of the atmosphere and the absolute quantity of the water vapour and how that changes with height. Um, so the precipitable water vapour dryness in the lower cell therefore has a large effect on the total atmosphere heating or cooling which we see um, and also notable is that only by including the water vapor do we enable this cold um, heating anomaly at the top of the cell to be captured um, which is what we see reflected in the temperature profile as well so i want to stress that i'm not saying um anything counter to what exists about the conventional um, model of the Saharan air layer. Um, but a lot of that work did focus on the dry anomaly at lower altitudes, um, particularly for the importance of it for um, sustaining the temperature inversion at the top of the marine um, boundary layer and suppressing convection and how this might relate to tropical cyclone development. Um, and I'm not suggesting either that the cell is deviating from being a near to well mixed and elevated layer. What I think hasn't um, been focused on so much perhaps in the past is the top of the cell and um, how that's structured and how that may be different on different occasions. Um, so I've got a little schematic here to um, describe this. So here we can see the dust concentration. We have our dusty cell with peak dust concentrations in about the middle of the Saharan air layer. Um, our non-self conditions in terms of um, potential temperature would be gently sloping 
um, like the solid line. And then as soon as we add um, a well mixed layer, so straightish in terms of potential temperature throughout that elevated layer, by definition, we then get a, a warmer portion at lower altitudes and a cooler portion at higher altitudes. And then similarly, we're going to get a drier um, portion at the bottom and a, a moister portion towards the top. And um, the warmer and stronger um, this mixing layer is, um, the greater these anomalies should be. Um, so I think this work then exposes the upper extension to this well mixed layer, these blue portions here, and draws some attention to that. Um, and it may also be important for um, capping alto cumulus clouds, which we typically often see at the top of this layer, um, both over the Saharan boundary layer and in the cell. Um, and they're obviously very important to the radiation balance too. There have been quite a few um, studies which either did or didn't find some similar um, properties um, to what we've been looking at. I won't read out all of these other than to say some studies have looked at this a lot and not found similar upper layer moistenings. Um, some found a hint of it and given various explanations. Um, but particularly um, the papers by Guttelben et al recently have found enhanced water vapor over the Western Atlantic in the cell. Um, and looked at how this water vapor drives um, strong long wave cooling at the top of the cell. Uh, and water vapor has also been found to be enhanced in biomass burning aerosol layers. So dust is not the only one. So where does this water vapor come from in the cell? Um, this is my explanation for it. In the cases we sampled, um, we looked at the dust sources because um, we we're interested in where the dust was coming from, partly for the composition. Um, and you can see here a series of Saviri imagery. Um, so in these images, dust appears as bright pink. So you can see, for example, here some bright pink um, coming out from this deep cloud. Deep cloud is shown as um, dark red. Um, and I, I frequently look at these to look for haboobs. Um, so we get convective um, outflows from mesoscale convective systems, which can have strong downdrafts with very strong gusty outflow winds. Um, which can be very effective at raising dust. And you get these images at 15 minute resolution. So it enables you to, to backtrack in time and see where dust that we samples, where it had come from as the satellite imagery evolves backwards. Um, and in all of our cases that we sampled, um, each case can be traced back to the cold pool outflow, which is circled in white for each of these cases and sometimes more than one. Um, and a haboob um, or cold pool outflow of dust that was generated as a result. Um, I should stress that um, the water vapour is not caused by the presence of dust, rather I'm suggesting that both originate from um, the same dynamics and meteorology which drive the same features causing um, enhanced water vapour um, and dust uplift. Um, and so some previous work, uh, particularly by John Marsham, has been shown that um, dust uplifted by cold pool outflows has been shown to be strongly associated with increased water vapour over the Sahara. So I think it seems logical that if dust over the Sahara, particularly in these dusty um, haboob-like environment uplift cases, is associated with lots of water vapour, then as the dust is transported westwards, it would make sense that that water vapour as a tracer remains to some extent with the dust layer. So then this brings on a further question. Um, is this upper cell moisture that we've been seeing, is it just something that's been under investigated in the past or could it be some kind of temporal trend? A nice paper by Evan et al 2015 um, looked at water vapour content in the Saharan heat low region finding that it increased over the last 30 years due to um, water vapour temperature driven feedbacks. So therefore, could the cell be moistening too is an important question to consider and also have cold pool outflow dust emissions changed over time. Difficult questions to answer. Um, so some just some thoughts now, really. Um, how do these radiative effects um, feed into various um, things that we're studying? So firstly, the radiative effect. Uh, lots of work recently, um, particularly by um, Ed B. and Koch, has looked at um, how coarse dust particles change the radiative balance. 
Um, Sorry, the second bullet point should have a, a reference to uh, DiBiagio, I think 2020. Um, and both these pieces of work have found that the course dust um, shifts the radiative effects away from the shortwave negative radiative effects at the top of atmosphere and more towards the positive. So then if we take these results here and combine that with an upper sal enhanced moisture, which um, contributes to positive radiative effect, this will further shift the top of atmosphere radiative dust away from a, a cooling and more towards a warming. What about the transport of coarse dust? Um, so this result, the results here show there's significant shortwave heating from dust um, and also significant longwave heating um, at the bottom of the cell from um, reduced lower cell moisture or dryness at the bottom of the cell. Um, and this will be dominant at night where we don't have the shortwave impacts. So therefore this could contribute to the overall heating of dust and transport in the elevated cell and therefore potentially contribute to the retention of coarse dust. Um, there's been some work in the past on the diurnal effects of dust transport, um, for example, by uh, Joseph Gasteiger. Um, and some of us are currently looking into that at the moment um, through the Dazzle project. A uh, little bit on the limitations of this project, it is only 20, 22 profiles from one month and one year, so um, wider spatial and temporal analysis is definitely um, required um, to take it further. Raises some questions, so for example, is that upper cell water vapour enhancement present throughout the summer? Does it vary with convective activity over Africa if it's related to these mesoscale convective systems in the cold pool outflows? Um, what's the interannual variability? What's the variation as the cell progresses westwards? Um, to its advantage, though, the aircraft does um, provide perfectly co-located dust and meteorological information at high resolution, um, whereas satellite and perhaps reanalysis information would be required um, to do some of the um, ideas pondered in the second bullet point there, which may not have such perfect um, perfect, um, such uh, high quality in situ information. Um, there are some uncertainties based on the optical properties of dust. I, I haven't shown this, but I did test a range of more and less absorbing dust. And this does quite strongly affect the direct radiative effect of the dust on its own, because um, it's sensitive to absorption. Um, so therefore, any perturbation you add due to water vapour on top of this is also sensitive to that. But nevertheless, the water vapor, water vapor perturbation does remain important. Um, and finally, just to add hygroscopicity, also any swelling of the dust and increased scattering um, due to these uh, moist layers is not accounted for here. So um, this is the summary, um, just a really brief slide. We've looked at in situ um, profiles from aircraft measurement over the tropical at least Atlantic, um, where we show that um, a dustier cell is increased is associated with increased um, water vapor in the upper cell. Um, the origins of the dust suggest this is associated with cold pool outflows as dust uplift, um, which potentially provide the water vapor, which is then transported westwards um, towards the cell away from the Sahara. Um, it definitely affects the top of atmosphere DRE. This is reduced by about 17% uh, when we include water vapor, so an increased warming effect. Uh, the drier lower cell um, is important for the overall atmospheric heating and the surface direct radiative effect. Um, and I think it points towards um, the need for larger temporal and spatial investigations and more investigation into the connection to cold pool outflows. And that's all. I uh, hope you're all still there. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. No, that was, we are still here, yes. Sorry for the noise during the presentation. That's okay, it's like home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it sounded like a kid playing, I don't know. Um, I want, it was uh, very interesting for me, and I want to point out that um, uh, this publication uh, shown here, uh, I just, uh, I read it before, uh, uh, before I, and advise to all to read it. It's very clear. It, it's it's very informative. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You, uh, I wish you could have told the reviewers that. <laughs> all I I would 
<laughs> always appreciated in a, in a paper, you know, to read it and uh, be very clear and uh, easy to read, yes, and informative. So um, please submit your question, um, uh, your questions in the slide link that Joanna has sent. Um, and we have uh, um, two, three questions, I think. Uh, so from uh, Stelios Katadzidis, uh, could you explain how is the radiative transfer run set up with only water vapor, but with increasing AOD for long wave? That's the first question. Can you say that again, please? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. Stelios Katadzidis, I'm, uh, I'm confused. <laughs> so uh, the question is, could you explain how is the radiative transfer run set up with only water vapor, the case of only water vapor uh, radiative trans transfer okay. run, how is the setup, and um, uh, but with increasing AOD for long wave. So, Stelio, do you want to... Maybe if I go back to this table. So, so in the water vapor only experiment, we don't include dust in terms of the radiation, but obviously we know in the, the real case in which the profile took its sample, there was dust. So that enables, um, for example, me to make plot figures like this, where so every single profile, every single point is one profile. Um, so we still know what the real AOD was, even if we don't include the dust in the simulation. I hope that makes sense. Stelio, you can uh, ask more if you want, if you want to turn on your mic. Yes, hello, hello, everybody. Hello, Claire. Hello. Yes, I just didn't understand how you you change your AOD in your model without uh, taking into account the dust. So that was the question. Okay. Does it? Does my answer make sense? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. The next question is from Adonis Gikas. Do you think that the inclusion of the sea salt particles within the mine, the marine boundary layer below the dust layer, will alter significantly the calculated uh, direct radiative effect? Um, I think not. So if I go back to the observations here, so these are measured extinction profiles. So, for example, in the dust lay, you can see that the dust is definitely dominant in terms of the extinction of the AOD. And um, there is some um, extinction down in the marine boundary layer. There is actually quite a lot of dust in the marine boundary layer. Um, as well as a little bit of sea salt. Um, so I think the dominant aerosol, even though there was sea, some sea salt present, is dust. So I, I don't think it's um, a significant um, alteration. Okay, uh, Adon, if you want to add something or, or uh, ask something more. Yes, I will be quick. Thank you very much, Claire, for a very interesting presentation. Yeah. And thank you, Alexander, for the question. Now, actually, what I would like to ask is that uh, I'm wondering if the structuring of the aerosol layers at the bottom, you have always there is always marine uh, particles, which are uh, where uh, high single scattering albedo, so they are very, very scattering particles. And then you have the superimposed the dust layer, and I'm wondering which the single scattering albedo is very low, as you saw, it was 0 0.86. So you have an absorbing layer above of a very scattering layer, and I was wondering if this can increase atmospheric warming, at least for the short wave radiation, which will have an impact also at the TOA. Yeah, I think I think the key thing is that the, the scattering layer in the MBL has a very low total AOD. So I, I think it has a small effect overall. But yes, you're right, you know, theoretically an absorbing layer above a bright layer. Yeah, because right. if you have a combination of very high AODs with very low, I'm talking about dust, with yeah. very low single scattering albedo, mm. and you are 
above of uh, you are on top of a layer which the single scattering albedo should be 0 0.98 or close to one let's say mm. then is i'm supposing i'm not pretty sure about that i have seen this when you have fresh smoke but i don't know if this can yeah. be valid I, also I think, for dust layer i think it's quite different in the case of smoke because the smoke is over cloud which is fairly thick optically uh -huh. um, and the smoke may be thick or not smoke not thick but here i think the aod of that marine layer is really really small um so although it has a high ssa i think uh -huh. the total interaction with the radiation is, is quite small okay thank you very much again but yeah maybe someday maybe i'll test it <laughs> yeah. thank you. so one more question from stelios uh, enhance enhanced moisture reduces the negative direct radiative effect from dust at the top of the atmosphere by 17 percent is this for high aods if so are these aods realistic or average for the area yeah good point so the that value of 17 percent which you can see here that is for aods greater than 0.6 so from this point on the figure to the right um i couldn't tell you off the top of my head what the mean aod is for this region but it, it's near to about half of our data point um so it's definitely common in the region um the reason we didn't extend it further across all aod's i think is because of the limited sample size um to make it a clear signal um and that's the main reason we did it that way Okay, so Stelio, do you have a comment or question on this? Yeah, not really. The question is, uh, well, this yield doesn't, uh, uh, it's just for uh, only a few words to, to write. So it was difficult to, to say that. But I mean, one of the main uh, findings of this work is this 70%, isn't it? So my question was if, we can say that uh, it's it's realistic for realistic AOD values for the area. Yeah, I don't have the numbers on the top of my head, I'm afraid, but I don't think it's That's too far true. off. Mm -hmm. Okay, Vasilis has raised his hand. Vasilis, yes, thank you, thank you, Alexandra. Thank you very much for the presentation, Claire. Very nice seeing all this together, all this information developing here. Uh, I would like to have a final question related to the super coarse mold. How do you see the impact maybe that the vertical gradient you saw here in temperature may uh, explain at a certain level how this particle sustaining in the atmosphere? And if this could be significant only in the case of high AODs, right? Because you have higher. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, for lower AODs, water vapor should not be a reason to explain super coarse mode presence, which is there anyways, right? Independently of the LD. Yeah, my, my feeling is that it's probably not the only player in contributing to coarse or super coarse dust transport. Maybe it's one of many players. If I go back to this figure of the heating rates, um, So we can see due to the, the water vapor, we, we have some amount of heating um, present here. But what I didn't say is that, you know, if this is due to the water vapor and the models are fairly well representing the water vapor, which I haven't checked, but I would guess they might do, models should be able to represent this because it's, um, you know, representing heating due to atmospheric gases should be something that they can do. Mm. So it shouldn't really be something that's missing in the models unless they're not representing the water vapor coming out of the Sahara somehow. So maybe it's plausible that they're not representing the, the convection due to resolution and that therefore they, they don't get that um, water vapor. So yeah, I'd love to compare this to some reanalyses or to some models and see if they, they manage to get that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> yeah. But in, in any case, even for low LEDs, we have a super coarse mode there, right? So this is something that 
uh, gives us, yeah, water vapor may explain a, a portion mm. of what we try to find related. I, I agree. Yeah, mm. thank you, Claire. Good question. <laughs> So I think uh, we don't see any more questions in the slider, and I think we maybe we should um, stop here. So uh, Claire has some time uh, to to leave. Um, Claire, thank you very much. Uh, I think this first webinar of uh, the webinar series for Pagia for Calvar uh, was a, a very good start for the series, and. Um, Actually, we have uh, we have some um, measurements from um, uh, in the surface of radiation in the surface uh, from a SCOS experiment, and we are very interested in uh, also in looking in this water vapor effect on uh, on the radiation in the surface, and maybe we will proceed with this uh, work. Um, so we will keep you posted with this. Sounds good. <laughs> and uh, yes, thank you very much for your uh, presentation today. Yeah, thank you all. It's great to be here and uh, great to have some good questions. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.